How's it going? Steven here. Today, we're taking things nice, easy, and light. So first up, we have Bud Light. Introduced in 1982 and produced by Anheuser-Busch as a subsidiary of AB InBev, it currently holds the most market share in the American Macro Light Lager category. I've been trying to come up with Bud Light's unique selling point and... I'm stumped. Constantly changing packaging, being confrontational about adjunct use while using rice, dilly dilly marketing made with rice, hops, barley, yeast, and water. Alcohol content is 4.2%. Your Highness is a nice little throwback to the other episode where we did Budweiser. Kind of a missed opportunity not calling it the Prince of Beers, seeing as how Budweiser is called the King of Beers. Well, we'll have a look at the appearance, but pretty much all of these are going to have a very similar appearance. It's going to be super, super pale yellow, basically crystal clear. The head has stayed around a lot longer than I thought it would. I feel like I keep saying that a lot now. <laughs> so yeah, mostly this has that rice sweetness. It's a very similar aroma to normal Budweiser, but everything's kind of notched down, which is kind of difficult to believe just because Budweiser itself is already notched down. Yeah, it has a little bit of a graininess to it, and there's a much more prominent green apple aspect coming through it. All right, let's go ahead and have a taste. Cheers. Yeah, this is why I'm not the biggest fan of Bud Light, which is interesting because I'm a bigger fan of Bud Weiser, but Bud Light is just all rice. There's hardly any other character going on. It's just kind of watery. Basically, there's a little spritz of bitterness and rice, and then there's just this lingering sweetness, and there's that green apple. Kind of takes up the front portion of your mouth. I think it would be better if it just dried up, if it was really clean, but it just kind of lingers for a really long time. At some point, it turns into just bland sweetness. There's not a pleasant, snappy rice sweetness to it. There's not a bready, sort of full, rounded kind of sweetness to it. It's a difficult thing to pin down. It's, it's one of those that's taken me a long time to try to figure out, and I still haven't figured it out. Yeah, it's, it's not my favorite one out of these, which I've always found, even personally, very weird, because Budweiser has always been one that I've liked, and Bud Light, you would think, would be a shoe in For a beer that's trying very hard to be inoffensive, this is one of the more offensive ones. <laughs> this currently holds the most market share in the light beer category, which has always astonished me because there are far better options available. The less good aspects of Budweiser magnified. <laughs> but there's no corn in it. Next up, we have Coors Light. Introduced in the 1940s by Coors Brewing Company and produced by Molson Coors. It was produced before World War II, discontinued, then brought back in response to Miller Lite in 1978. It was going after those youngins. It's probably best known for the Rocky Mountains on the package changing from white to blue when the temperature is 39 degrees or lower. Made with corn syrup, hop extract, barley, yeast, and water. Alcohol content is 4.2%. So the head died on this pretty much immediately because I just poured this, so that's not great. <laughs> it's more or less the same color as Bud Light, maybe slightly paler. It's about as light as it goes for beer. Very uniform bubbles. Um, I didn't, I guess I didn't really point that out with Bud Light. It's a little eerie. <laughs> it's kind of like soda. I keep having to swirl it to get the foam back so I can smell something if there's some aroma popping up. Yeah, it's, it's mostly that green apple kind of character. That's pretty much always what I pick up with Coors. There is actually a little bread character there. That's kind of shocking. And then there is that that corn corn syrup kind of thing going on with it too. That kind of bready character and that corn character are kind of fighting each other on the nose. The corn comes through more when the foam dies. All right, cheers. Ooh. So you remember how I was saying that Coors Banquet has that green apple character? Well, the thing about Coors Banquet is that there's other things to come in to kind of diminish or be alongside of it. This doesn't have that. It is all green apple, 100% of the time. <laughs> I think maybe if this had um, much more lively carbonation, it would scrub off your palate a lot quicker. So you wouldn't have this lingering green apple. It kind of clings to the front of your mouth and like a little bit to the sides and it doesn't go away for a really long time. And then as it warms up, when you smell it, it kind of smells like apple juice. <laughs> Don't smell it, just drink it straight from the can and you're fine. Actually, let's try that. Yeah, it's not much better. <laughs> it's, I don't know, maybe I'm changing my opinion on Bud Light. Maybe I would take Bud Light over this. That should really tell you something. Now I feel silly all those times that I ordered Coors Light at the bar and not Bud Light. Weird. Up next, we have Michelob Ultra, a first for me. Introduced in 2002 and produced by Anheuser-Busch as a subsidiary of AB InBev. It's the most recent entry in the American macro light lager space, rapidly gaining market share. Kind of stepping on your own toes there, AB. It's the lowest calorie and lowest carb option in our lineup. Made with rice, Hercules hops, malt, yeast, and water. Alcohol content is 4.2%. So there's a couple interesting things about this beer that I discovered. So one of the things was that they actually tell you what hops are in this. 
One of the interesting things that I experienced with this beer when I was still a buyer was that it really started to pick up some steam. I feel like it could have been one of two things. One was that it was really, really aggressively marketed, which is probably half of the truth. And the other half, I feel like this beer captured the market of people who drank beer, then moved over to seltzers because they were being more health conscious or whatever, realized that pretty much most seltzers suck, and then came back to beer, but they wanted something that still fulfilled the role of seltzers. It was the perfect beer for them. Pretty much the same color as the rest of them. This one still has a little bit of a head left, even though I poured it a while ago. It had a pretty nice fluffy head too. So this one's got to have the most closed aroma out of any of them so far. There's like the faintest bit of rice, and that's it. There's no hop character. There's no other malt character here. All right, let's have a taste. Cheers. Well, I can tell you they've worked very hard to make this as flavorless as possible. Kind of a, a hard thing to hit in the, in the light beer category. Most of the other ones have at least some, even if it's not good, aroma and flavor. And I think we can say safely that pretty much everything else in the category is designed to have basically no flavor, but this one is the first one to do it. I kind of knew just by the aroma that we weren't going to be dealing with a, an explosion of flavor, but it's like the ghost of rice. It's not bad. It's not gross in any way. Wow. I kind of wish there was offensive flavor here. Then that way there would be something to talk about. The seltzer thing is starting to make a lot more sense now because it always seemed to me that the people that were buying this either used to buy, you know, your White Claw and Truly and stuff like that, or they bought this with those. It's probably one of the worst rated light beers that I've seen. And not just worst rated in the sense that a handful of people disliked it. And I can kind of see why. Because even light beer drinkers, they want a little bit of a beer flavor. Yeah, the light beers have tried really hard to have minimal or no flavor, but I feel like in this case, science has gone too far. And last up is Miller Lite. Introduced in 1973 by the Miller Brewing Company and produced by Miller as a subsidiary of Molson Coors. It was developed in 1967, trialed in test markets in 1973, then moved national in 1978. It was the first successful macro light beer in the United States, causing Coors Light's resurrection and competition from AB. Made with corn syrup, Galena and Saws hops and hop extract, malt, yeast, and water. Alcohol content is 4.2%. So this is another interesting one too, like the Michelob Ultra that list the hops that they really use. I can nerd out over it, but um, it's not very useful to the average consumer. I also really like that this beer manages expectations from the get-go. It doesn't try to tell you anything more than it's a fine Pilsner beer. Let's have a look at this beer real quick. It's not nearly as clear. There's not anything floating around in there. This has a little bit more of a golden, maybe a coppery kind of color to it. Ah, this is why I like this one. It has a notable bread character to it. Even to a lesser extent, it has a, a bread crust kind of thing. There's nothing else wrong with it. There's nothing else going on with it. Uh, uh, just a plain bready character out of your lager. Hey, I'll take it. Yeah, right now there's no green apple-y anything going on, which is always a good sign. Cheers. Ah, there's a little bit of a flash of a green apple kind of midway through the sip. It's interesting that you, I don't really smell it, but it does pop in the taste, but at least it's well supported by uh, that bready character. It carries from the beginning to the end. And so it finishes up pretty clean and it's a little dry as well. It's starting to get more dry. So it's kind of a, it takes a little time to build. There's a little bit more of that corn character starting to come through as this warms up. The green apple's still there. It lingers slightly longer than it did at the beginning, but it's gone before the finish happens. And I think the, the other thing that this has really going for it, that weirdly enough, the other three have kind of failed miserably at, the carbonation is very lively on this so it scrubs your palate quickly. So it really facilitates the refreshing aspect. And that's kind of the point of these light beers is, you know, you're supposed to take a sip and it's supposed to just disappear. This is actually the first time that I've sat down and tried to analyze Miller Lite. You know, I see it at the bar and there's Bud Light and Coors Light and Miller Lite. I order Miller Lite every time. There's always the, the idea in my head that maybe I was wrong about that beer or maybe sitting down and actually evaluating it, my opinion will change. And uh, I feel like my opinion has not been swayed at all. <laughs> it's, it's a fine Pilsner. That's what it is. <laughs> well, that's the end of this sesh. I was kind of hoping that the Michelob Ultra would kind of swoop in and maybe take the second spot or take the crown, but it's probably the, the one I would take last. I feel like Bud Light and Coors Light kind of tie for the middle. As far as the one I'm vibing with the most, well, it remains the Miller Light, actually. Well, if you're chilling with the beer yourself, why not pop on this video over here? Cheers, and thanks for watching.